This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. My guest today is Joseph Badaracco. He is a professor at the Harvard Business School. His specialty happens to be business ethics. Whew, that's a mouthful, right? What do you think of when you think of business ethics? You probably think of some good and some bad. Most people probably think of only bad. Today, Joseph and I go into his newest book, Step Back, all about bringing reflection into our life. Let's face it, why do people like so many of these stoic and zen quotations that we all share on social media? They cause us to reflect, to step back, to look at what we're doing. Are we just some robot mindlessly whipping through life, making good and bad decisions with no plan at all? A lot of people are, for sure. So how in the world do you find clarity? amid turbulence of our daily work and personal life. It's about finding that time for pause. Let's think about the small decisions, the big goals. Joseph lays out a plan for how one can find that time to reflect. He digs in with a lot of pros to get their insights and gives us a footprint, a template to try and find some time to reflect. Because I got to tell you, in this day and age where it's emotional outbursts constantly across social media, it sure seems like some people, maybe a lot of people, maybe all of us, should be reflecting a hell of a lot more and hitting the pause button, not the send button. Without any further delay, let's jump right into my conversation with Joseph Badaracco. Look, here's the first question I want to warm you up with, because I do think I've had a lot of interesting people on this podcast. I guess I could go back and look at the six or seven Nobel Prize winners that I've had on this show and see if they were Rhodes Scholars, but I don't know if they were. I could go double check. You might be my first Rhodes Scholar. I want you to take me back in time. How did this start to unfold? I mean, for us folks vicariously looking in, what age? Is it something that you put in motion? Did people approach you? Were you a great student? Were you naturally talented? I want to know the stuff, Joseph. (laughs) Well, I'll tell you what I recall. I went to college at a Jesuit institution called St. Louis University in St. Louis, Missouri. And I was active in student government. I did well as a student. I guess I had a 3.8 average or something like that. It was before grade inflation and before this era now where if you don't have a 4.0, you don't exist. I went to my father's office and typed out an essay as part of my application. I remember being kind of aggravated about something and almost decided not to do it, but I did. And apparently I interviewed well, which is really critical to both phases of the selection process. So I was chosen and got the opportunity to go to Oxford. Shortly afterwards, I was given a definition of a Rhodes Scholar, which is a young man. There are now women Rhodes Scholars as well, so this may well apply to them, but a young man with a very promising past. And the idea is that you have some stuff on your resume when you finish college, you win the scholarship, and then you go to Oxford where the academic year consists of three eight-week terms. So you have six weeks free around the December holidays, six weeks free in the spring, four months free in the summer. You don't go to class. You write an essay a week. Money appears automatically in your British bank account. So the idea is this pretty much ruins people for kind of get up every morning and go to work type activities. There have been a few famous Rhodes Scholars, and I guess a couple infamous ones. Everybody else has just sort of gone on and done I've done a range of things. Most of us sort of bask in the glory of the folks who really have made big contributions. 
it does sound great still. I mean, it's right there. It's not the same as a Nobel Prize, but it sounds pretty damn good. Tell me, though, what was the, you described the situation, the study, but is there anything you can recall that you took from the experience? Someone you met, a conversation, a professor, was there anything interesting during that time or was it too faded a memory? I'm not sure there was any strong individual or particular experience, but I think it was then that I I got a sense that I really would like to be an academic of some kind. In other words, to really study things. But I also began to discover that I liked studying a broad range of things rather than really specializing. I worked for Price Waterhouse for a couple of years and learned some basic accounting, which was very valuable. And then I got an MBA from Harvard Business School, which is a generalist degree. Then I decided to stay and do a doctorate on a generalist topic. People's minds work in different ways. And some people will pick a target and home in on it like a laser and do amazing things. And my mind tends to move in these sort of broader directions. And I think that probably originated. The program I did in Oxford was called Philosophy, Politics, and Economics. Right there, I was indicating my interest in doing a range of things rather than concentrating. When you define this desire to go general, I assume you're saying this because at the time, your peers were questioning you, going different directions. You were the oddball out. What was the thought process? Everybody, it seemed, was going to law school. And the idea was that If you went to law school, then you could go into public service of some kind. My father had been a lawyer. He never liked being a lawyer. I understood that most people who got law degrees worked as lawyers. They didn't automatically become U.S. senators. I decided not to go to law school, not to even apply. But it's funny, I had this, I remember quite clearly, I got the application material from Harvard Business School while I was in Oxford. And I remember flipping through it and seeing these courses on marketing and manufacturing and thinking, I would never be interested in doing anything like this. And I remember just literally flinging the information packet into a wastebasket. It was working for Price Waterhouse for a couple of years that I started realizing that management, running an organization, being responsible for part of an organization is really a fascinating and kind of broad gauge challenge. As I said, my inclinations were generalist. And if you want to run an organization company of any size these days, you've got to be a pretty broad gauge person. So I said, well, maybe I ought to have a second thought at Harvard Business School and got into the program. And that's where I've been ever since. Let me bring it up to current. I think there's a, from a general perspective, you're talking to somebody who I think we're going to share that same perspective. I'm definitely not a specialist. I like this idea, and I've seen folks talk about the notion of talent stacks, different things that add all. Maybe you're not the best at any one thing, but if you can do 10 things really well, you start to be dangerous. But let me take you to current day. So folks can go pick up the news here and there, and if they want to find something negative, about the Harvard experience. They can easily find it. They can find something, oh, this, that. They can complain. They can, And to me, a lot of these things, ultimately, at their root level, and I did not go to Harvard, but in defense of Harvard, a lot of these kinds of things, people don't say this, but to me, it always seems like a kind of a jealousy or envy or something like that, just because they didn't go. I want to know the positive things. So here you are, you're teaching at the Harvard Business School today. Give me your feeling. You wake up every day, you work with students. I mean, things have changed during Corona and you can speak to that. But speak to me about the experience, what you get out of it, the inspiration, the energy. Talk about how it makes you feel and the good things that are going on there. Because like I said, we can find all the negative headlines. I don't care about that stuff. Sure. And the negative headlines are important because they keep us reflecting on what we're doing and We have amazing resources and whether we're really doing all we should with the resources we have. Speaking just personally, though, about the positive things, there's looking back now for several decades, there are really two of them. 
One is the amazing students who are now attracted to management programs and MBA programs. I got in trouble. I gave a talk at a reunion maybe 20 years ago. Someone asked me at some event what I thought about the students who were coming in. And I think I said that, boy, in terms of students, these are the good old days. These are just fantastic students. And I could just see people's energy level <laughs> draining <laughs> because they thought they were in the best class, whatever it was, 20, 30 years ago. But we get just amazing students from around the world with a wide range of backgrounds. And they aren't all students born with a silver spoon in their mouth by any means either. We look hard for people with a wide range of backgrounds. That's a great experience for the students because they learn a lot from each other. And it's a great experience for me to the extent I get to spend time with them. And then, as I emphasized earlier, management is kind of a generalist art. And Harvard Business School does not have a research orthodoxy. There's not a single right way to do research. So I've been able to look at pretty open-ended topics, study them in whatever way I thought was the right way given the topic, but also of interest to me, and then write them up in formats, typically short, accessible books that I thought were worth writing and that I enjoyed writing. For me, it's basically been, there's ups and downs inevitably, but it's been a long stretch in a big candy store. <laughs> that, that's my essential answer to your question. It's a long time ago. Florida State University, definitely not a Harvard MBA, but an MBA. And I do recall, and I was the entrepreneurial type, and I really probably should not have been in an MBA program at age 25 or whenever it was. I remember thinking when I got there, my objective, look, I was not an academic and I was, we could talk forever about what the reasons were that I went, but that's immaterial now. But I remember my thinking when I got there was like, oh, gosh, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm an entrepreneur. This is why I'm here. And I got there and I remember meeting a guy that first day and he had a blue blazer on and three gold buttons. And I remember thinking, oh, damn. And we were talking about maximizing seat utilization on airplanes. And I remember thinking, this is, what mistake have I made? <laughs> what mistake have I made? So speak to me about the range of students at Harvard today. Where are we in terms of entrepreneurs versus ultimately job seekers? Is it 50-50? How does that break down the desires of students? Well, I'll give you an impression. I don't have statistics. And it's an impression that's not just a students in the MBA program at Harvard now, but more broadly. And I think, coming back to your mention of entrepreneurship, I think that a lot of students would love to start the next Google or something like that. But entrepreneurship is really fading in this country. There are fewer business startups. There's tons of money available, venture capital, private equity, which often means there's too much money thrown at any half-decent idea. Things get saturated. Everybody loses if there's too many competitors. If you've got a pretty good idea for a company, piece of software, let's say, there's a good chance that somebody at Amazon or Google or Facebook will be observing you. And if it's a genuinely good idea, you've got the risk that they will copy it and sort of say, well, sue me if you're not happy about that. Or maybe they'll buy you, and that's good. You can have trouble raising money nowadays, I understand it. This is particularly true in Silicon Valley because there's said to be kind of a death zone around the big tech giants. Venture capitalists don't want to put money in the startup companies if they are going to be copied or destroyed or bought up prematurely by one of the giants. If you think of the generation that's coming out of schools now, when they were quite young, they had the dot-com bubble bursting. And then 12 years ago, we had the beginning of the Great Recession that led to layoffs in a lot of people's families. Long, slow recovery from the Great Recession. And then now? Yeah. So if you can get on one of these big super tankers or cruise ships called a big stable company, that looks like a pretty smart next move rather than going out and starting something on your own. And this, by the way, isn't just a complaint about young people today. I think there's just a kind of caution, 
conservatism, hunkered down tendency that's really becoming widespread in this country, and maybe it was already pretty widespread in Europe. We were talking about Asia before. Asia seems to be the dynamic part of the world. I don't know if you were going there in your thinking, but when you outline a scenario that the big tech giants, the fangs or whatever they're called these days, I think it's the four or five of them, is that scenario that you're outlining, are you saying something negative? I think it's really complicated, and I don't mean that as just a way of dodging your question. They are huge. At current prices, they sure look overvalued, okay? They have enormous reach and power. The other night, my wife and I were watching something on television, and we realized we were watching Amazon Prime. We had just ordered some groceries from Amazon, and we had done something else somewhere in the Amazon. We hadn't bought a book, but we had done all these other things. So they're everywhere. They provide remarkable services, often at great prices. Their technology is great. They also compete with each other in some way. So it's really hard to say whether they are on balance competitive or anti-competitive. They're just an unprecedented business economic phenomenon. They're sort of like what we were saying about COVID-19 a while ago. We're just at the beginning. And I don't think we really understand their impact, but they're multi-sided and some facets are negative, some are extraordinary and positive. It does seem like with the success they've had so far, and people always say there's been big companies and big players in the past, but as you point out, we've got four or five of them right now, massive cash, massive market penetration in all kinds of businesses. It does seem like their moats that they've built around their castles are impenetrable in the sense that even if one of their businesses was to crater, they've got so much cash, they can just look over the horizon and say, who's inventing that new whatever? Okay, buy them. Yeah. Well, and there's also hidden assets that they have, not hidden from financial analysts or close observers, but most people who think about Amazon don't realize that it's a huge provider of server capacity for everybody in the world. It's got Amazon Web Services. It's an immense and extraordinarily profitable company. And so if they see an opportunity, they can turn a fire hose of cash on that opportunity. These are fascinating companies, and I try to learn about as much as I can about them. From people who work there, you get a little glimpse from following them in the business press. And I don't have a final judgment on them. How much does teaching change in an MBA program at Harvard, given their growth, and especially in the last five to 10 years, things have changed. I mean, what you would generally talk about with students can't exactly be the same thing that you would have talked about if you were teaching in 1995 when Netscape went public. Absolutely. There's a challenge there for us, especially for older faculty, which is understanding and being relevant in a world with the amazing technology that these companies are introducing. Software that Amazon uses to run its amazing logistics systems, Prime Video and all the rest, is amazingly complicated. They are in many ways a tech company, so they're investing huge amounts in the next generation of technology. There's almost no business nowadays that isn't, in some ways, a tech business. So with the ubiquity of tech, that's something that a lot of students understand because they did electrical engineering undergraduate degrees or they learned some code and then they did some coding for a couple of years. That's a tougher thing for older faculty to keep up on. On the other hand, as I was saying before, it's a fascinating time to be teaching because You can ask questions like, are these monopolists? Are they competitive? What's their strategy? Do we have to throw out old concepts of strategy in order to understand what Amazon's strategy is? Until 10 years ago, a company that was in as many businesses as Amazon is in now was called a conglomerate, and it was supposed to be discounted on financial markets because you couldn't manage something that big. Amazon is doing spectacularly well. 
to steal from you. Well, not to steal from you, but I think you source Machiavelli when you say this, and I'm going to paraphrase it a little bit, but as I'm asking these types of questions and I go through your world, you've got this expression, the world is what it is. So we can sit here and we can debate this and that and all these other kinds of things, whether it's right, whether it's wrong. But the other side of the coin is the world is what it is. Amazon is what it is. Whether we like it or not, it is what it is. That's right. From an academic's point of view, it's a fascinating thing to observe and try to understand. From somebody running a business or trying to make a career these days, it's challenging because you've got to live in a world with these giants. A facet of the world today, the world as it is, is that these giants not only have enormous economic power, some of which they've earned with phenomenal products, they've got a lot of political power. They've got big, sophisticated lobbying operations in capitals around the world, in the U.S., in important states. Legislators and regulators often defer to what these giant companies want. This isn't something new. This happened with U.S. Steel and it happened with General Motors. You can go back through history. That's another aspect of this sort of conservatism, this slowdown that I was talking about. These big companies not only can fight you in the marketplace, fight you for customers, they can also fight the lobbies of legislatures, and they do that as well. It might not be as profitable as creating a movie streaming service, but you and I can share one piece of understanding, which and maybe we can share this with other people too. But when you create a piece of IP that's yours, a book, a song, a piece of code, there's still the chance. Now, you might not be able to, if you're an MBA student at Harvard and you want to think of massive scale, it might not be the same thing. But in terms of opportunity to create, creating IP is still something that's really, it's what I do. I love doing it. I mean, you can do really well at it. You might not create the next Instagram, but I don't think sometimes people think about that. They just only look at the big monoliths. They don't think about, hey, if I sit down and I write that next great novel or compose that particular song or that film script or whatnot, it's a different way of looking at the world. I agree very much. Putting it in a business context, if you want to create a business, you've really got to be in love with whatever it is you are trying to create. And it is a creative act, and that's really engaging for a lot of people. But you need a second kind of creativity once you've got whatever the IP is, the new piece of code or whatever. And that is you need the sort of managerial creativity to build it out fast and to protect it, stay under the radar so that the giants don't mess things up. The slogan, of course, is get big fast. This is a second kind of creativity that often isn't appreciated. We think of the team or the lonely artist creating something. Managing something and building something successful these days takes an awful lot of day-by-day creativity. It's not recorded in a copyright or anything like that, but working with people, putting the financing together, keeping the momentum going, it's a performance art. The process. The process. And I think it's just not appreciated, but it is an art form, just like the initial creative act. Let me shift gears on you to something that I know is near and dear to you. I'm not sure where I'm going to go with it. I like this word, and I've done so many episodes here over the years, and I don't think I've specifically had a conversation about ethics. And it does seem like, whether it's personal or business or political, And I guess there can be all kinds of definitions and there can be different types of ethics and all these types of things. It does seem like that America right now is having trouble with ethics. And it seems like people are having trouble getting on the right path. I don't know if you concur or not, but speak to me when you think about ethics in the modern age and maybe even define for the audience how you view ethics. Well, just quickly in terms of definitions, there's the one we use teaching MBA students and that I use if I talk to executives. And that's very much around 
corporate responsibility. So if you're running an organization or a company, who are you accountable to and what are you accountable for doing? Behind that is a personal question. What kind of a life do you want to live? What kind of legacy do you want to have? What do you want the people you work with to feel and think and believe about you? And then there's a pragmatic element, because if you're not doing things that actually make a difference and change the world, then ethics is just sort of can just be sort of feel good talk. So you've got accountability, you've got character, and then you've got elements of pragmatism if you're in a position of leadership. And by the way, by leadership, I don't mean just CEO. Leadership, be running a department. You still have to think about who you're accountable to, impact on your character, and what's going to work. So that's within the confines of what I teach most of the time. Boy, the societal question is such a tough one. People just don't realize fundamentally how big and dynamic and fertile America is. So I think that if you really look around this country, almost everything good that human beings have aspired to do is now being done by significant groups of people in this country. And you can look in other directions and see a lot of things that nobody should be doing, and that's going on in this country as well. So there's just sort of no way to pull the whole thing together. I do think there's some problems that are really serious. One is people getting hunkered down in their own little echo chambers, because between social media and some television, you can see and get just the news that reinforces your beliefs. And I'm, I'm sure a victim of this as well. I think our scientific literacy leaves a whole lot to be desired as the world gets more and more complicated, not just with technology, but with advances in science. That's a real vulnerability. We have almost no trust in our federal government given the resources it has and spends and the impact on people's lives, that's a profound problem because if people just write it off, then it's left to the politicians and the insiders and the lobbyists to pursue their interests. That's a big problem. I sometimes tell students who are thinking about maybe 10 years in business and then going into public service that they really ought to think about running for mayor in their town or city, or maybe if things work out well, run for governor. These are jobs where ideology matters less, getting things done, working with business groups, other groups to move things forward matters more. And then coming to COVID for just a moment, there's this technical term that academics use called state capacity. In other words, what is a government good at actually doing or delivering on? Our federal state capacity just looks appalling. Not only were we late, other countries were late on COVID-19, but we have just, if you look at the CDC bungling the initial testing, it goes on and on and on. Our government used to be good at either doing things or orchestrating things, fighting, winning two world wars, putting a man on the moon, etc. It's not clear what our government has the capacity to do uh, anymore. And then we've got this really complicated turmoil in society today. And I'm not sure if that's a bad thing or a good thing. I'm not endorsing looting. Nobody endorses looting. But a lot of really important questions are now on the table in the mainstream media. Who's been getting a fair shake? Who hasn't been getting a fair shake? How do we create more opportunities? These are really important questions for a society to address. This has led, of course, to acrimony. It's led to some polarization. But I think we're confronting a lot of complex realities, and people might be yelling at each other, which isn't good, but at least they're talking about them. And if you contrast that with what's often described as like the golden age of the 1950s, when you had great lifestyles for basically white families who were in suburbs, college education, and tough times for a lot of other people, I'm not sure which was a better period. So I would not romanticize the past, and I wouldn't be as critical about what's going on out there now, as painful and difficult as it is sometimes.
And I think that's ethics. To come back to your main point, that is ethics, putting serious issues on the table and confronting them seriously, issues about rights, responsibilities, hard work. Do you get the rewards for hard work? All those things. You mentioned public service. I grew up 15 miles outside Washington, D.C. in Northern Virginia. I unfortunately understand too much about what goes on in Washington from a very behind the scenes perspective. When I hear the term public service, and again, you make a fair point about something like a mayor, because a mayor can help with the economic development, can approve a plan to have a building built, et cetera, and can really change how people live on a day-to-day basis. But if I look at Congress, look at the House, I look at the Senate, I look at presidents, I think of the term public service. It sure looks like these days that a lot of people, even if they're saying that, are coming to town. They're coming to D.C. to get rich. People go to Silicon Valley to get rich. Okay, I get it. It wasn't about coming to D.C. to get rich. And maybe also to a deeper point that you were saying about putting a man on the moon and fighting world wars, and you can run with this, maybe we're just at one of these weird spells where there's not something big to get America to rally around. What's often been big and that we've rallied around was an external threat. And this isn't just the U.S., it's other countries as well. Even putting a man on the moon was us catching up with and then beating the Soviets, who got the first Sputnik up whenever it was in 1957, and we were behind in the space race. So starting in the 1990s, the U.S. emerged as the wealthiest, most powerful country in the world and really didn't seem to have any threats like that. Then we had the dot-com bubble and everybody got rich until early 2000. A scholar has recently written a book with an interesting idea in it that in the old days, and it's easy to romanticize the old days, a lot of people took jobs like member of Congress and they had a sense of responsibilities that came with the job. And now these jobs more often are viewed as platforms for pursuing more personal interests. So you mentioned getting rich. Or if you're elected to Congress, what do you want to do next? Probably want to get in the Senate. That means you don't have to spend time, hours, literally every day on a phone trying to raise money because you run for re-election every two years. And then you get into the Senate, and maybe it's kind of a caricature, but a third of the senators or something like that view themselves as future presidents in waiting. This seems to be less about doing good for the country and more about themselves and the groups that are going to keep them in power. And then, of course, if you leave government, you become a lobbyist. And I think four or five of the wealthiest counties in the country are right around the Washington, D.C., Virginia area. Six out of 10. (laughs) Is that right? Yep. I know my wife and I were in D.C. This is about 10 years ago with our youngest daughter on the standard tour of the great monuments. And my wife first noticed, and then I noticed there were so many people around who were really well-dressed. People dress well in Boston. These people were really well-dressed. And then I realized it's the lawyers and the lobbyists, et cetera. And a lot of people in the rest of the country realize that and have kind of written off our federal government. And given its impact on our lives, that's dangerous. Yeah. It's going to be interesting to see how that shakes out. You know, as we're having this conversation, and I'm looking at this word on my page of notes here, I'm looking at the word reflection. It's kind of what we've been doing this whole conversation, which is really where you go in your new work, step back. It's all about reflection. Speak to me about the genesis of wanting to write about reflection. I mean, it seems like something that, okay, we should all reflect. We should all think about to take a step back and whatnot, but- We really don't. I mean, because here we are, you and I are reflecting in this whole conversation, and I don't think most people reflect anymore. People just, I don't know, I don't want to say bark. People just, it's just kind of boom, 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 attack, attack, attack. And there's not really that kind of pondering and sharing. I mean, look, I don't know how people feel when they hear you talk. I don't know if they, I imagine that most people are listening to you talk and say, I agree with that guy. Now, if you were to say, If you were to get into the specifics of some particular political opinion, then maybe there'd be this 50%, 50% of the country likes you and 50% of the country doesn't like you. But I think that's what I really miss is that 
having smart conversations with smart people and reflecting about what's going on without the burden of the political dynamic. Yeah. You put your finger on what got me to do this study of reflection because you said it's a good thing. And I think we have been doing it. And I bet a lot of people who are listening think reflection is a very good thing and have advised other people to reflect. And you hear this advice typically without any follow up that says, oh, by the way, this is what reflection is. And then if you're really busy, This is how you actually find time to do it. What I was curious about was what reflection was and is for people who are really busy. And I focused on people basically in companies, entry level, right up through CEOs. I interviewed about 100 people and I asked, do you reflect? When do you reflect? Is it valuable? And the funny thing about the interviews was that initially most of them would say, I think I'm the wrong person. I don't have time to reflect. And we would talk for a while. And then what I gradually discovered was that they had a misconception about reflection. And that was, it was like going on a retreat or going up to the mountain, an extended period of solitude and tranquility. Almost no one has time for that these days. And they certainly didn't. But they had found lots of little bits of time, two minutes, five minutes, maybe 10 minutes sometimes in their lives when they could step back a little bit and reflect. And I ultimately called this mosaic reflection because it's a collection of small elements rather than, as I said, going up to the mountain for some extended retreat. What I was amazed as I got further into it was discovering that almost everyone of this hundred folks I interviewed had their own particular mosaic, their own set of times of the day, times of the week, places where they did little bits of reflecting. That's basically what the book describes. It's kind of a sort of a user's manual describing lots of different ways in which they put together these mosaics of reflection. I wanted to learn when and what busy people did that was reflection. But I also wanted to put it This may be sort of the scholar in me coming out against the long history of serious thought about reflection. If you don't have a lot of time to reflect, which people don't, you better spend the time well. What does that mean? So I looked in depth at several classics of reflection, like the meditations of the Roman emperor Marcus Aurelius, and tried to also distill what really counts as reflection. The idea is that if you're going to take these little bits of time, how do you spend it well? And just to add one more piece, the final piece to this, there are really, if you look historically, there's three basic approaches. One of them I call downshifting. The classic word for it is contemplation. But it's turning off the parts of your mind that are trying to solve problems and scratching things off your to-do lists. And there's lots of ways to just... Let your mind run free for a little while or focus your mind gently. It can be looking out windows. It can be nature. For some people, it was sort of mindfulness meditation. Lots of different ways of doing it. The second that goes back centuries is called pondering. And it's the kind of thing we've been doing in this interview, which is looking at things from a range of perspectives before you say, okay, what's the right answer? What are we going to do? And the third classic part of reflection is what I called measuring up. And that's stopping, stepping back and saying, I've got to make a decision. Am I going to meet the standards I've set for myself and the standards that other people expect me to meet? Am I going to measure up to those standards? What's the yardstick? My advice is don't be a perfectionist about reflection. Find something that's good enough, works in your life. Find times and places where you can step back a little bit and then use the time well on one of these three approaches. I'll give you, just to probably talk a little too long here, but a great comment, and it's right at the beginning of the book, came from a guy who started a really successful private equity company. He was on the board of a lot of companies where his firm had made an investment, and there typically were young people running the companies. And he says he tells these young CEOs, 
that if he ever comes into their office and finds them with their feet up on their desk, looking out the window, he's going to double their salary. And the idea of that is that it's really hard to step back. <laughs> I got to double your salary that you don't have to go up to the mountain. You can just look out the window and take a little break, but it's really, really important to do. Could you have seen yourself writing this book with a different subtitle? And where I'm going with this is, could you have seen writing the subtitle instead of how to bring the art of reflection into your busy life? Could you have seen writing it as how to bring the art of reflection into your life. That word busy is just jumping out at me. And I'm not sure why. There's got to be a story behind it because writing that subtitle without the word busy is different. Yes. Well, a lot of people are really busy, as you know. For those who are still employed these days, despite the COVID recession, a lot of them are even busier because their organizations are trying to figure out how to adapt to this new world. It's easy to say, boy, I'm so busy, I don't reflect, I can't reflect, I'd love to, but it's just not in the cards. It's those people I wanted to address. I wanted to say, look, of course you're busy, that's not gonna change, but you're probably doing more reflecting than you think. You ought to pay attention to when and where and how you do it. Try to do it a little more often and try to do it right. Here's the basic ways of doing it right, and here's how a lot of other busy people have pulled it off. Busy is really the people I want to address. As I think about you, your world, I was born in 1968. It has caused a lot of reflection because a guy born in 68, that was a pretty volatile year, as you know, in the United States of America, a very volatile year for all kinds of reasons. People will have to go back and do a few searches if they were too young to remember. It's been an interesting reflection for me and even a digging process to make all these observations of a place that I thought I knew something about or I thought I had some fears about or whatnot. And then to get there and to reflect for many years on every little nitty gritty detail and to contrast it to where I grew up and to contrast it to what people, my friends and family, how they see the world. It's been a fascinating, interesting period for me, which is making its way towards a script. But it's just been so interesting to just reflect on. And I'm one of these people that was lucky enough in my early 40s to go on this adventure to where, yes, I'm busy and stayed busy and wrote more books and all that kind of stuff. But I just, I stumbled into this reflection that was kind of like, you know, it just knocked my socks off. Well, what you described, I think, is a very important kind of reflection on this extended multi-year basis. I called it pondering in the book, and it has its origin in religious traditions. And it's looking at an issue or a problem from a variety of perspectives before you do the final analysis and decide what to do. And so you've had this extraordinary experience of growing up in the U.S., seeing it from the inside, at least through the windows of your life, and now looking at it from the outside, as well as the conversations that you have with people on your podcast. And I want to emphasize that reflection is often thought of as a solitary activity. A lot of the people I interviewed said that they reflected best when they had conversations with a particular person. It wasn't just any conversation, but there were some people who they just sort of clicked with, they felt comfortable, they could be a little more open, they could put things that were concerning them on the table. That's one example of what I'm trying to do in the book, which is to broaden the range of what people think of as reflection. Doing it through conversations to get different perspectives on something before you move to a decision, it, that's reflection. It's not meditation. It's not classic stuff. It's not sitting in the lotus position, but it's real reflection. I'll give you an interesting observation about doing interviews, and perhaps you can relate to this. I think for me, even though I'm 51, I feel like the interview process of talking to so many wise voices has probably aged me, not in a physical bad way, but just kind of 
wisdom, a kind of a osmosis, kind of just sucking it all in. But I'm curious, and I tell this also before I get to the curious part, I tell this to people that my most interesting guests to me are generally people over the age of 70. And I generally, I don't have as much fun talking to people that are like 40 or 50 because for whatever reason, people are thinking too much about what they're going to say next. And okay, maybe I could find a few instances of where you might have done this or did that in this conversation, but not many, not many at all. You've just kind of been syrupy and you've just kind of said how you feel, said how you think. We don't get enough of that these days. Yeah. Well, you know, there's this notion around and it may be somewhat widespread among younger people. And again, I don't mean to beat up on the younger generation, but you often hear advice that you should think of yourself as having a brand and you want to manage your brand. And that means you do have to be careful about how you look and who you're with and your social media profile and what you say. And be careful if you're unscripted because that might undermine the brand. And if you say something you really shouldn't say and it gets on social media, you got a big problem. It's part of this whole sense I have and concern I have that we're moving into a much more cautious phase of things. We need something. I don't know what it is. That's, I don't think it's artificial intelligence. I don't think it's electronic or autonomous vehicles. Maybe it'll be something spectacular over the next decade coming out of biotech. I don't know. But a lot of people are just hunkered down trying to get through the day. And you can understand why if you look at their lives. And it's often an accomplishment that they do so. As I said, a lot of younger people, I think, want to get on a big super tanker rather than take a lot of risks these days. It's an interesting observation. I can't, I can't find a good argument against that perspective. I think it's probably true and it's sad. The only thing is in terms of what critics describe as turmoil and breakdown and what others describe as kind of a very difficult period of realism and re-examination that's going on in our country now. You've got a lot of young people out there taking stands, marching. Look at some of the, and this has been said so many times about the marches and protests for Black Lives Matter. This wasn't just African Americans. This was all sorts of people. I think I saw a survey this morning that said that 25% of people who identify themselves as conservative Republicans are sympathetic with Black Lives Matter. There's something in the air and people are doing some rethinking. They're doing a lot of confronting, a lot of yelling. That's not good. But maybe there's some rethinking going on as well. That might be a positive feature of, of life today. We'll see. Yeah, I can't keep you. I could keep picking your mind. I come back to the, the end of the day and none of us live forever. And even if there's something negative in front of us and we want to blame somebody or this or that. I mean, at the end of the day, all we really have are ourselves and you got to just reach down and regardless of the situation. I mean, I see, I see really poor kids in third world countries that sometimes I think they got the hustle gene and Americans have lost it. That's a whole different conversation. We could go down that aisle for a, a long time. The book, a step back, how to bring the art of reflection into your busy life. Joseph, very cool stuff. Again, I appreciate you coming on and sharing wisdom. I could, like I said, I could probably just keep, you can see, I could just keep picking away and find things to get you to expand here and expand there. Hey, is there a, beyond finding you at Harvard, your business school webpage, is there a website you would like to send people to? I don't have a website or the school may have created one, but I never look at it. So the best thing is just, if you put in my name and Harvard Business School, you'll track me down. Yeah. The book on Amazon and all that kind of fun stuff. Yeah. I enjoy the conversation a lot, Michael. And as you said, it was a kind of reflection. I hope the people listening get to do their own version of it fairly often. Joseph, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money in up, down, and surprise markets. 
Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money, Trend Following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.